episode in store for you today. In just a couple minutes, I'm going to be joined by Dan Coyle, author of The Culture Code, for a conversation about the keys to creating culture for teams to thrive. Now, we often think, at least I think, of culture as something that just happens, just magically appears, but we now know that this just isn't true. And Dan's research has uncovered three keys to creating a winning culture, and he's going to show us how we can start applying these three principles so we can begin impacting our very own teams and cultures. Dan, I uh, couldn't be more excited to welcome you to the show. Thanks for joining us. Hey, great to be here with you, Jeff. Thanks for having me. It's a delight to be with your community here. Yeah, this is great. Uh, and I have to tell you, like hands down, your book, The Culture Code, is the best book I read in 2019. I mean, I, I think it, it captivated our entire team. It, uh, it really aligns nicely with the work that we do with leadership teams to the point that we started sending the book to CEOs all across Western Canada. So it's had a huge impact on us and our community. And I think that's why we've had such a compelling response to you joining us today. You know, and, and I have to ask, how did you get curious about this in the first place? So what is it about great teams and what makes them tick? Like why, how have, and why have you chosen to focus your life in, in this pursuit? And that's, that's, a, that's a good question. I guess if you get down to it, this is a Canadian group, crew, right? Like I grew Large up in Alaska <laughs> and, and I know what it's like to sort of either get along or not get along with people in, in where you have challenges, where you have to sort of get through a winter or have some, have some mountain to climb or something like that. So I guess yeah. I grew up around that. Um, and I wrote a book where I visited all these very ta these talent hotbeds around the world uh, a while ago. And I kept, and I bet you guys have had this experience too, where you walk into a certain locker room or you walk into a certain school, or you walk into a certain family, and like things feel different there, right? Like people yeah. are clicking, and, and things are happening, and there's more creativity, and there's more performance, and more productivity, and more of joy, and like I kept encountering that in these, in these places, and so it just naturally sort of got me wondering, like, what's that made of? Like, like you know, it feels like magic, is it actually magic or is it something that can be measured, understood? Is there a process underneath that? And, and that's what sent me on this journey of, you know, I spent five years visiting some of the highest performing cultures on the planet and, and seeing what makes them tick. Yeah. yeah thanks for that, Dan. And, and that's probably a good segue into even defining what culture is. I mean, I think culture can be a very nebulous term, but what does culture mean to you? How do you define it? Well, you know, people start out when you say that word, they've got a certain mental model in their head, right? Yeah. Oh, our culture. And it's sort of the mental model we typically have is that culture is like kind of the feel of a group, like it's their personality or their identity. And it's kind of soft and it's made up of values and integrity and trust and teamwork. We have all these words. And um, the problem with that view is that it's really mushy. Like that's why conversations around culture are super mushy and kind of frustrating. So Rather than talk, let me just give you an image of what good culture is. It's, it's like picture a flock of birds or maybe a school of fish, but let's say a flock of birds moving through the sky all together. They're connected, right? And they're, they're weaving through a forest together, all connected. They're solving problems at speed. They're moving towards some goal. They're connected and they're sharing information like they're aware of each other. Now that mental image is that's a Navy SEAL team on a mission. Like that's what it is. It's a connected group moving through obstacles toward a goal, communicating and being connected. It's Pixar making a movie. Like they're, who's in charge? It's kind of hard to tell actually. It's connected people sharing, moving toward a goal. So that image really is more functional, right? So I would say a functional definition of culture is a set of relationships moving toward a goal. Like that's what it is. That's what it is. And so because it's defined like that, it's about the interactions between people and the connections between people. Um, and that, that, that functional definition of culture is what you see in all of these places because they've got to do those three things. They got to stay connected, right? They got to be connected. They got to be in. You can't have people going off and, and just being in their separate group. They got to be in. They got to be sharing information and making good decisions. And then they have to be moving toward a goal. So a set of relationships moving toward a goal. And the better you get at creating that connection, at creating that sharing of information and at defining that goal so that people can feel it and move toward it. That's, you know, right now it's a hard time to be a leader in a company. You know, it's a really hard time, but thinking about culture, not as this like frosting on the cupcake and the feel good stuff and ping pong and beanbag chairs and a beer fridge. It's good to have those things, but 
The real culture is a set of relationships connected, sharing information, moving toward a goal. Yeah, great definition. Uh, you mentioned cupcakes, and, and I think up until uh, you know recent years, I think I I felt like culture was a bit like baking a cake, where you throw all these ingredients in. So maybe a good strategy, and you throw a bunch of good people, you mix it all up, and then you you sort of put it in the oven, and you just hope that it's going to taste good. Right. Huh. And you just hope. And I think that that's how I viewed culture is that let's put all these ingredients together and let's just hope they get along. Let's hope that they're conscientious. And then and then, you know, if, if everything goes perfectly, we are going to have this culture that we read about in books. And I, and I think that you're, you're what your book has done so well, Dan, is you very much distilled three things that we have to do to create that kind of delicious tasting culture. What are those three things? Yeah, what are the flour, butter, and sugar of this? Yeah, system? absolutely. Right, right. The three ingredients. Okay, the three ingredients are safety, vulnerability, building safety, sharing vulnerability, and establishing purpose. Those, those are the three. So one, you know, we can take them one by one, or we can go all three at once, sure. whatever, you, whatever you prefer. Yeah, yeah. Go, let's, let's start with safety. And I know you've had a chance to spend some time with some amazing teams. Let's start with there. Yeah, safety. Like, how do teams, we've all had that feeling where we're like in a group, right? You walk into a room or you walk into a meeting or you become part of a team. And we've all had experience in our life where we just feel really good with those people. We feel really safe. It does feel like magic, but actually that's called psychological safety, a term most of you have heard of. But it's created. It doesn't just happen. It's created through a, a series of belonging cues. And belonging cues are short, vivid behaviors. They're not just words. It's not just, hey, I like you. They're behaviors that send a signal of, I see you, I care, we share a future. Um, you have a voice here. Like there are behaviors that do that. And I saw a couple of really cool examples. I guess my favorite one was with the San Antonio Spurs. You know, if there's any basketball fans out there, you know that the Spurs are the most successful team in American sports for the last like 25 years. They're drafting at the bottom of the draft. They're getting the worst players and they keep sort of finding a way to win. And what makes them more interesting is that they're coached by like the crankiest man on earth. Like Greg Popovich is 212 years old and he yells a lot. It's like, what's going on there? So I went to San Antonio and I walked on the, I got there the day after they had lost to their arch rival. Perfect day to get there because they just lost a game. Popovich, their coach walks onto the court. He goes straight. This is the day after a practice. He goes straight to the player who missed the big shot the night before. Yeah. And he puts his hand on that player's shoulder and he starts talking to that player, not about the game, but he starts talking about the restaurant and the dinner that Popovich had arranged for that player the night before and the bottle of wine that Popovich had ordered for that player. You know, it turns out the Spurs eat together more often than most families do. I mean, they're unbelievable. And then and actually at the end of each year, each coach gets an album, a leather bound album and in it are the menus of the places they visited and the labels of the wines that they've had. And then it was after that, it was time to watch the film. And so it's like, okay, now we're going to see Popovich, you know, coach these guys up. And so they all file in to watch the film. But what starts to play is not game film. What starts to play is a documentary, a CNN documentary on the history of the civil rights movement. And he begins the, a conversation around that like asking them, what, what would your parents have done? Well, tell me, how did your family navigate this? What would you do today? How, what do you think about this? And it was incredible. And that guy, I mean, Popovich is a fire hose of belonging cues. He is continually sending signals with his behaviors, not with his words. He is continually sending signals with his behaviors that you are connected. We are part of something bigger. I hear you. We, you share a voice. We share a future. And, and that is what connects them, not not just some, you know, some words on a board or something like that. It's, it's all about the behaviors. Yeah. And it's um, one of the things that occurs to me when I hear you tell that story is how time consuming it is as well. And we, and I, and there is a point, I think I want to come back to the time consuming part, but, uh, but let's maybe talk about this, the second piece first, which is the shared vulnerability uh, uh, component, Dan. Yeah. How do you share vulnerability? Cause it's, it's hard to share. Vulnerability is not a word that we hear much at work because you don't like to seem stupid at work. And you don't like to share risk, you know, assume risk at work. Work is often about sort of concealing vulnerability. But something happened when I visited these top performing cultures. And these were, you know, Pixar, San Antonio, Spurs, IDO, um, Navy SEALs, Team Six, very, very high performing cultures. And the leaders of those cultures kept opening up in these weird ways. Like I was, um, I was walking around Pixar with a guy named Ed Catmull, who's the president of Pixar. He founded it with Steve Jobs. And we're walking through this really cool studio building. And it was a really cool building. Like at Pixar, they have all these 
like hidden bars. Like if you touch, you know, Nemo's nose, um, a gin bar comes out of the wall and it's, it's amazing. It's great. And so I was walking through there and I just sort of absentmindedly said to Ed Catmull, I said, Hey, this is the coolest building I've ever seen. And then he stopped and he gets shoulder to shoulder, eye to eye with me. And he says, actually, this building was a huge mistake. I said, what? He said, no, no, it's a huge mistake. We made the hallways too narrow. Like we're a creative company. We can't have people just shooting past each other, but that's what they do. They don't stop and talk. And we yeah. put the atrium in the wrong spot. People don't go here for lunch. They go to Taco Bell. Like we don't need people to go to Taco Bell. We need them to stay here. And he admitted all these mistakes. And then he said, but the biggest mistake we made was that we made all these mistakes and we didn't even realize we were making them. I mean, it was, it was kind of stunning to see how open he was with his problems, his challenges, his weakness. And then after that, yeah. I found myself in Virginia Beach, Virginia, having breakfast with a guy named Dave Cooper, who's a retired Navy SEAL who trained the troops that got bin Laden, like he was their coach. And he says during the course of breakfast, he says, the four most important words a leader can say are, I screwed that up. Which is kind of blew me away. You know, typically we think leaders should be confident. They should, they should absolutely show the way with great purpose and conviction. And here were two leaders, great leaders doing exactly the opposite. And what's happening actually underneath that is, is they're building trust. What's this is how trust is built. It's called a vulnerability loop. Yeah. It, when two people are vulnerable together, when two people actually share what's really going on, they create more trust, more connection, more cohesion, more chemistry. And so smart groups have built in these vulnerability loops all throughout. They've kind of operationalized them. When you're at the Navy SEALs, they do something called an AAR after every mission, after yeah. every training run. And they circle up and they talk about what went right, what went wrong, what are we doing differently next time? And it's super hard to have that conversation. It's an incredibly difficult, vulnerable conversation to have because you've got to say, I screwed that up. I think you screwed that up. And that is, it's so hard. And yet it is absolutely at the key, at the, at the, at the foundation of why they work so well together. Yeah. And think in your own life about who are you closest to? Is it people you've never been vulnerable with? Or is it people that you've been the most vulnerable with? Yeah. Like, I think we think about vulnerability and trust backwards. Normally we think like, yeah. I'm going to build up trust and then we can be vulnerable together after we build trust, but we've got it backwards. Yeah. Those moments of vulnerability in your group, those moments where people are getting real and telling the truth, those are the moments that create trust. Yeah. And I think like that was a, that was a big, um, I think paradigm shift for me, Dan is, is learning that from you is that it's not trust that comes first. There's a, but there's something else that I think about a lot and it's, and it's, it's the power position. I'm of the opinion and the belief that you cannot, you cannot be fallible and demonstrate that kind of openness and vulnerability if you're not the people uh, in the power position. So if you're working for people uh, uh, that have more power and influence and they're not modeling those behaviors, I don't think, I don't think you can create that in a company or any kind of team. Would you, how do you view that? It's important for the leader to do it first. The, the leader has to signal fallibility first. They have to set that tone where that becomes safe to do. And a lot of leaders don't necessarily realize that. Like they actually have to over communicate their fallibility. The, the people that I hung out with the leaders in these groups that I visited, they were exceptional at doing what Ed Catmull did, which was to kind of overdo it a little bit. Yeah. They always framed it around learning. This is the thing that I think people with the power structure, you actually can. Curiosity and learning is a different way to be vulnerable. To say, hey, I don't have a clue what I'm doing. That's one thing you probably don't want to do around your boss. But if to say, hey, I don't know, I'd love to learn about that. Completely different frame completely different narrative, completely different signal. And so that's why the communities of learning and groups around learning are so incredibly powerful and businesses that, that sort of make this commitment to everybody getting better, um, sort of have a leg up, you know, building everything around that learning frame is, uh, is, is an incredibly powerful way to create trust. How does senior leaders maintain competency, but still demonstrate that over, you know, over the top fallibility that you mentioned? You know, it's, it's continually staying on their learning edge. Like if you are continuing to learn, you are failing. Like that's how learning is built, right? You, if you're, if you are, there's a great, okay. This actually is my favorite. One of my favorite examples of this is that when Gretzky was practicing one day, he was skating. He's heck of a, he was the weakest, right? He was the slowest 
Um, he couldn't bench press his own weight. He was, he was incredible. But when he would practice, occasionally he would fall down. And if you look at that, you think, well, he's the best hockey player in the world. Why is the best hockey player in the world falling down? And the answer is because he's going to the edge of his ability. Yeah. Like he's figuring out where that edge is. And, and that's the way that leaders can continue to show that fallibility, I think, because they're saying they're humble and they're saying, I really don't have all the answers. I, I, and that's true. You really don't. You may feel like you do, but you don't. So, so to actually get to come to grips with that and to say, man, what I don't know actually is my friend here. I need to sort of express that, figure out what I don't know and have other people around me. Let's learn about it together. Yeah, and Gretzky is an example that will resonate for most of our audience, Dan. Thanks for that. Uh, I have a, a friend that coached Gretzky when he was in New York and uh, marvels at how coachable he was. And that was, you know, that, that was the last stop of his career, his illustrious career. So right up until the end, he was asking and wanting constructive uh, feedback and criticism. So you've mentioned, uh, so the first two things that we have to do, number one was safety. <clears throat> number two is this idea of shared vulnerability. What's the third component to, high, to a high-performing culture? From a functional point of view, let's go back to that flock of birds. It's direction. Like, where are we headed? What's, what's our North Star? Which really comes down to establishing a super clear purpose. And I guess the best, the best story about purpose that I, that I know happened uh, in 1982 uh, with the Tylenol poisonings. You know, yeah. Johnson & Johnson um, you know, woke up one day and their product, uh, someone had poisoned, put poison in bottles of extra strength Tylenol. Eight people died. And so Johnson & Johnson gets a call that their product is a murder weapon. But what happened next was extraordinary. The, the whole company reacted sort of like that flock of birds. Like they invented tamper-proof packaging and rolled it out in eight weeks. They voluntarily pulled $150 million worth of product from the shelves against the advice of the FBI. The FBI was saying, do not do it. They pulled it anyway. They were unbelievably open with the legal community, with public. And as a result, that's the gold standard of crisis response to this day. Like that's the, that is the gold standard of corporate crisis response. And when you say how'd they do that and you roll back the tape, what you find out is that there was an executive there, this guy named James Burke, who for four years prior to the Tylenol poisonings created this all company conversation around the question, just one simple question, what comes first? What comes first for Johnson & Johnson? Because a lot of things could come first, just like with any company. A lot of things could come first. Stock price, R&D, relationships with clients, uh, each other could come first. But what they decided in that conversation, what comes first for us, our North Star, is the health of the user of our product. And they carved it into granite and they called it the credo. And as a result, of that conversation, when the Tylenol poisonings happened, they didn't need to like, we should have a meeting, right? They didn't need to have a meeting. They didn't need to have a, they didn't even need to think. They knew what to do. Should we invent tamper-proof packaging? It's a no-brainer. You know, should we pull the product from our shelves against the advice of the FBI? No-brainer. So building that North Star and filling, think of it as a windshield that you've got. All right, if you're in a group, your group has a windshield. It's, it's a thing they look at that is conceptualizing the road ahead. And your job as a leader is to fill that windshield with really clear signals of what comes first and how to get there. What comes first, what problems you're gonna encounter and how to get there. So you get this sort of emotional GPS. Um, and it's funny when you walk into good cultures and I'll bet you guys have all felt this. When you walk into strong cultures, they feel a little corny at first. Yeah. Like walk into Disney right? Walk into Pixar, walk into a Navy SEAL Team 6 training thing. It's kind of over the top. Like, like, come on guys. Like, I get it. You know, I get it. But you know, they use all these corny mantras and there's visual reminders of what they do everywhere. And it's like, you know, that, but actually that kind of overdone environment is a signal that this is a strong culture. It's, it's the windshield. They're building this windshield so that when something happens, they all know where true North is. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a great point. And I think I think part of the courtiness, Dan, is just to make sure everybody understands it and gets it. I I saw a survey earlier this week where when senior executives are surveyed and they're asked, how often are your employees thinking about work away from the job? Senior executives estimated it was like 60% of their time. When those employees are asked, they said 2%. So 
<laughs> and like, wow. So if if we're not over communicating those things uh, to the point, I think where our employees are making fun of us for our mantras and our sayings, uh, we're probably not we're probably not uh, 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 doing it well enough. You know, you hit on something else, I think, too, Dan, which is decision making in uncertain times and that North Star. Right. And uh, and and the guiding principles, you know, values based decision making. I don't think a lot of us understood what that meant until this pandemic hit. And I think it's been the ultimate equalizer that if you're in a leader of business, you've been dealing with uncertainty at levels that you probably haven't seen before, unless you were heavily involved in maybe the real estate crash or the financial crisis back in 08 or those kinds of things. Uh, um, so I think that that you hit on a really important point there. Something else that, that uh, sort of occurs to me is if you were in this mid-level there's, you know, you're in a 300 person organization, you're a mid-level manager. Oftentimes you're at sort of the whim of the senior leaders to give you direction and directives on what to do. And you may not always agree with those. Yeah. There's a story that you tell about the Navy SEALs and how they prepared for the Bin Laden mission that I think speaks to that. And I wondered if you'd be willing to share that with us here. Yeah, it's, it's about the guy I, I referenced earlier, Dave Cooper. Um, when they when he got called in one day, I think at the time only about three people knew where Osama was, and he was I think the fourth. And they were planning the mission, and his commander um, had a really clear idea of how he wanted to do the mission with helicopters. Like, all right, we're going to use helicopters. These new stealth helicopters, sort of new, um, they can go underneath the Pakistani radar and sneak in, and then we'll we'll rope down and we'll get him, and and then we'll get out of there, and. Dave Cooper had seen these helicopters before and he didn't really trust him. So he tried really hard to get that commander to change his mind really hard uh, to the point where Dave Cooper thought he was going to get fired. And finally he said, all right, I'm going to go along with this plan. I don't like it, but I'm going to, we're going to adapt. We're going to do rehearsal after rehearsal with these helicopters that we have to use. We're going to have them fake going down and crashing in every manner. And they trained in North Carolina, they trained in Afghanistan, um, rep after rep after rep after rep, doing AARs, doing the things that bring SEAL teams together, share, being super vulnerable, right? And, and making mistake after mistake after mistake after mistake together, analyzing what went wrong, doing it again, analyzing what went wrong, doing it again. And finally, when the night came, as some of you may remember, um, this is a while ago, but when the helicopters went in, uh, they did crash. They did crash. There was an unexpected downdraft uh, from the walls of the compound. Neither helicopter landed where it was supposed to be. One of them crashed inside the courtyard. But the second the SEALs came out, they solved the problem. The second they, they, they got in and out, they did it absolutely by the, by the book because, not because they were invincible to start with, but because they had been vulnerable together every single step of the way. So, from Dave's point of view, it, was, it wasn't the plan he had chosen. It wasn't at all. But he leaned on that core value of vulnerability and leaned on that core value of learning to make a team that was adaptive enough to solve that problem. And I think that, that question of being adaptive in the field is more urgent now than ever before. Like, yeah. it used to be the world was so a lot more predictable. It used to be you could sort of give people instructions and mm -hmm. they could expect to follow those instructions. But as quickly as things change now, those sorts of hierarchical organizations don't function very well. Um, you need to have organizations that are like that flock of birds or like that team of SEALs that can see a changing volatile environment, yeah. assess it, orient themselves, and solve a problem. And, and building those sorts of teams leans on trust. You can't, you can't have a sort of fear-based, authoritarian, everybody just follow your instructions world. In the same way that our military forces have evolved to, to be this way for this new world, um, it's, it's kind of a, a fascinating challenge for businesses to make that same evolution. Yeah, absolutely. And I just think that that story is so, um, it's so relatable for somebody in an organization that feels like they've got a game plan or a, or a, or a strategic initiative they don't, they don't fully buy into. And yet they're expected and, and even measured, their, their performance is measured against the success of that priority. And I think what happens in companies, if we apply that analogy, is that uh, managers either just refuse to do the mission, so it never happens, or they just blindly go about it uh, begrudgingly and the mission would have failed miserably. But there's the third option, is to figure out a way to galvanize your commitment, but still be authentic to your gut 
and your feelings and your unique perspective of it. So um, I think that's a, a really good story. Um, thanks, Dan. So something else I've been thinking a lot about is this notion of proximity. So it appears that proximity is really important for creating sort of connection and belonging. And I wondered if there's a two parts to this, but on, on the first part of this, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how proximity shows up in relationship building. Hey, we're just wired for it, right? I mean, we when you look at studies of people, there's something there's something called an Allen curve, and it's basically let's let's go with the Canada um, pandering again. It's a hockey stick, uh, sort of. It's very very steep, uh, and it basically shows that the closer you are to somebody, your communication with them goes way up. So it's not like well, if I'm you know ten feet away versus twenty feet away. If you're ten feet away versus twenty feet away in the office, like you can communicate like six times more. Yeah. So. It's, it's, it's exponential and it's kind of the way we're tribally wired, you might say. We're gonna communicate with people that are that close. So smart groups sort of take advantage of that and really pay, it, you really pay attention to the 15 feet around you. That's gonna be the most influential spot when it comes to building culture and the people that you're most connected to. One of the rules of thumb that uh, the scientists came up with was being on the different floor of a building is sort of like being in a different country you know, in terms of communication to really create that, which of course makes it this incredibly poignant challenge today as we communicate through these tiny little windows to each other. Um, it makes it a super interesting challenge and, and to build culture across that divide. Yeah. Well, and that's exactly where I was going next was this knowing now how important proximity is. Uh, that's why dogs are so beloved I hear is because when they, when they research animals, dogs out of any animal, keep the closest proximity to their owners. Oh, that's so, so cool. Like make that makes total sense. They're always wrapped around your leg or cuddling with you on the couch. And it's like, wow, yeah. no matter what I did today, my dog still loves me and they're still proximal with me. How do we do this in a virtual environment? Yeah, there's a few things that I've seen that, that, that are really, I think, incredibly useful. Some sort of, a few sort of principles, I would say. Number one, amplify your warmth. Like in order to create that, this, this, these, these screens diminish. They, we only get to see part of us, right? And then we're coming through this. We're coming through this. Just, you actually have to actively amplify your warmth, especially if you're a leader yeah. and communicate. If you, you, you need to smile bigger. You need to laugh harder. You need to ask more, be more curious, um, amplify your curiosity about people. Yeah. That's one thing. Another thing is to find space to just hang out and do nothing together online. And, and, there's a weird thing I've actually seen around eating. You know, breaking bread together is one of the most human things we can do. And a lot of companies are normalizing the idea of like just sitting around and we'd each be eating, uh, eating a bagel right now. And it's weirdly connective. I can't completely explain it. I don't know what the science is on it, but it's weirdly connective to actually just be watching someone eat and eating yourself is, is, a, is a cool way. And a third thing is to normalize conversations about mental health. You know, that's it. That is it. That is it. A vulnerable, really personal space. When we are in space with each other in physical space, it's easy to tell if somebody's having a down day and ask them about it. But in this new environment, we have to find ways to make that normal. To have to, to have ways that people can share and talk, and it's, that really comes down to leaders sharing their their stories about how they're doing. Yeah. So, yeah. It's just a, a few big picture things to do, but. Um, and, and I guess I would add another one, which is you need to carve out time to kind of practice reflection in this, in this Zoom world, like you have a meeting and then you're on to the next meeting. And it, it just sort of, we don't have the hallway walks, you know, with people after meetings. We don't have kind of those, those walks down the sidewalk or the lunch or that. So where we really sort of reflect together and process things. And so finding time to do that both by yourself um, maybe by writing things down, by keeping yeah. a, a journal, um, and also with other people. You know, I've seen a lot of companies do, they call it the hallway walk. And it's the yeah. time after the meeting or before the meeting where there's sort of an understood, we can hang out and, um, and catch up. And another cool tip that I've seen is to make one call a week to somebody uh, on kind of the fringe of your network. Yeah. You know, the studies show that in a virtual environment, those, we lose our loose ties first, like our loose ties are people that you normally would see and the person you bump into at the front desk, whatever. And, and those people are the ones that actually have a big impact on career and they actually have a pretty big impact on learning at times. And so to actually have a, a habit where you can reach out um, to somebody maybe on the outside of your network a little bit once a week and just, just call and catch up. 
Yeah, no, those are some really, really great ideas. Uh, there was a Fortune 500 company. I think it was a financial uh, in the financial industry. And they had all these kinds of silos and communication breakdowns. And they tried an experiment with, they had, they had everybody on uh, in, uh, in both divisions had to do one 10 minute call with each other one-on-one -on -one per week for a month. The oh. only rules they had is the call had to be 10 minutes long and they could not talk about work. And, and we often would apply like a lot of thinking, strategic thinking, you know, train people on communication skills and crucial conversations and take them away for a couple of days on a retreat to fix these communication barriers. It was as simple as a 10 minute conversation once a week for a month. Couldn't talk about work. Oh, that's so cool. That's really <clears throat> cool. There's a good book I'd recommend too to your, to your audience too. It's called Virtual Rituals. It's by yeah. name Len Fajardo, F-A-J-A-R-D-O. Um, and I know somebody might be able to put, find a link to it, but uh, I think yeah. it's just coming out or maybe it is coming out, but it's all about, you know, in the virtual space, you can't just rely on people to pay attention like you can in the physical space. You have to actually create a new experience. And so it's filled with all these, some of them seem kind of goofy, like let's all take five deep breaths together or, you know, it has to do with music. He has a lot of different games people can play. Um, it's a little woo woo, but I think it's appropriate to this challenge because you can't just sort of uh, expect to connect in the same old way. It's a real yeah. interesting stretch. Mm -hmm. And that book has some nice ideas on how to make that stretch. Yeah, great advice, Dan. Uh, and I, I think there's, I, what I'm finding anyways, there's two camps of leaders. There's, there's the camp of leader that says that they just can't create connection in a virtual world. There's another category of leader that's being very clever and re very resourceful. I, in fact, I was sent uh, an email last night from one of our clients, uh, Amanda from Almeida. She's the VP of HR there. She sent me this very articulate email that she sent out to all employees that then had this list of creative ways for them to build connection and culture in the pandemic. And they can choose, she's challenging all employees to choose three of the things on the list uh, in the next 30 days. And I just thought it was wonderful. And such a heartfelt message. I was, you know, I kind of was, uh, was getting a little teared up just reading the email. I thought, wow, what an amazing thing to work for a, for a company like that. That's awesome. Send me that. I'd love to see that. Yeah, I will. I'll get her permission and I'll send it off to you for sure. Um, so there's something else, Dan. Like all, and you've spent some time with these remarkable teams. I mean, you talk about Greg Popovich with the San Antonio Spurs. And it, it occurs to me that his life seems to be about building connection and culture. And I wonder, like, is it possible for us to just have a nine to five job as a leader and build these kinds of cultures? Or do we have to sacrifice other areas of our business if we actually want to do these things in a, in a manner that's going to make an impact? Well, it depends on, um, I guess it's very situational is not an easy answer to that question. I, I'll share a couple observations that I've had, which is there's definitely a trade-off between, yeah. uh, there is a trade-off between I'm going to, I'm going to treat my job as my core thing in my family and my culture, my group and, and personal life, those, those things, that's a tension to embrace. I think in some ways that's a tension to explore and to acknowledge. Um, yeah. and I think that you, you often, uh, will see people, leaders of really strong cultures have their family life can sometimes be a train wreck because yeah. they put all their love and attention and energy into their, into their work. And, and so that's something to be, to be super aware of. Um, you know, at, at the same time, there, there, it is a long game. And so we, we always, always have this, you know, in terms of taking away from the, the rest of the, from the blocking and tackling of the business. Um, I think culture often feels inefficient. You know, that, that's the fact of it. For, 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 to have those 10 minute conversations, it can't be about work, feels like you're not doing work right? To do the hangout where we're just eating hamburgers feels like we're not doing work. And so you have to pull your camera back and really see culture from this relational point of view. If you are building a relationship, then it is helping in the long run. Then all those interactions downstream are going to be that much faster and better and easier and more innovative and more efficient. So this idea of, um, I, th I think one concept to really get across is sort of like cultural fitness. And, and just like with your body, if you wanna be fit, you gotta experience some pain, it takes time. It feels like you don't wanna to go to the gym some days. It feels like it's kind of a waste of time, but that's how you get strong. So the investment you make in building those strong relationships pays off in your performance down the line. You can't feel it yet, right? You can't, that's, that's the way it works. That's the way fitness works too, right? Yeah, you need yeah. to do the workout to get the results. So um, I think being willing 
a sign in good leaders that I see is that they're willing to make this investment and to say, all right, there's a moment here where I have to either be really productive or I need to tend to my people. Yeah. And they will choose people and, and it will pay off in productivity down the line. Yeah. And I, when I hear you talk about belonging cues, I, like I love what you said there. It's almost like uh, if you're a leader or have any kind of influence whatsoever with whatever team you're involved with, I almost think of, of, of us all as having to be like cell phone towers inside those teams that you're constantly sending out belonging cues, like this frequency of what we're trying to achieve, all the three things that you're talking about, uh, uh, Dan. So uh, that, that's helpful. Um, what about uh, different, like different personality styles and how that plays in? So it occurs to me, like you talk again, a lot about Greg Popovich, yep. the culture that he's created. But then I look at like my favorite coach of all time is Bill Belichick, New England Patriots, of course. Yep. Uh, a lot of people are thumbs and thumbs downing right now in the chat line, I'm sure, are rolling their eyes. Uh, Greg Popovich has, has built this culture partly through wine and dinners. Bill <laughs> Belichick uh, would not be, I don't think, caught dead having dinner and wine with his players. And yet they have both created remarkable cultural uh, phenomenons to create these, these impactful, these just the longevity of success. Like, how do you explain that? You know, a, a couple of thoughts. I mean, the first is structural. Football is a hierarchical, old-fashioned, I call the play, you do what I say, uh, we're going to diagram this out, um, that resembles how life used to be in some ways. Like, that's how business life used to be. That's how hospitals used to be. That's how law firms used to be. Um, and so that style of leadership, which is sort of based on fear, deep down, like um, it, it, it still works. It, it can be very effective. It really can. That's the yeah. thing. The, the structural argument here is that I think Popovich's approach works more toward the world we live in now, which yeah. is like basketball. Do you know exactly what's going to happen every time they bring it down the court in your business? No. Mm -hmm. Do you need them to be aware for possibilities and opportunities and challenges? Yes. So yeah. It's a question of, of authoritarian sort of structure versus a, a more of a cellular uh, freelance organic structure that we find. Um, so I think, I think, and there's nothing wrong. You can build a great organization around fear. You really can. You just can only do really simple things together at times. So that, that's one thought. Um, you know, the other thought though, is that there are a lot of paths to greatness. Like Warren Buffett does not bear much resemblance to Steve Jobs who does not bear much resemblance to Richard Branson. Yeah. There are three incredible thinkers and leaders who are absolutely different from each other in almost every measurable way. And so there are many mm -hmm. roots in life. Like it's, it's, yeah. it's like a mountain and there's a lot of different paths up it. And to sort of say that there's only one way um, is, is always, always going to be a, a false way. Um, yeah. I've also heard that Belichick is quite funny in person yeah. Yeah. It, and he's got this deep, uh, he always shows up. I have a friend who's in the Navy and Bill Belichick came to hang out with some of the Navy SEALs and Bill Belichick wore a blazer and a tie. Yeah. Like if you can imagine that, right? So they're a completely different vibe, completely different set. So the, 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 the sort of craggy face he shows to the world is not his full, not his full self. Yeah, it sounds like it. We had Michael Lombardi, uh, who's won some Super Bowls with Belichick. Uh, he was on uh, Unleashed in season one, and I think he he talked about some of the things that I think we would we would point to and say he's much different. Uh, uh, exactly, uh, exactly like you're saying. Now, another piece, or actually, I want to remind people: hang on with us till the end of the episode today for your chance to win a signed copy of Dan Coyle's book, The Culture Code. So we're uh, happy to give some of those away. I'm also uh, cognizant, Dan, that a lot of people that are joining us today have got teams uh, that are upwards of like, you know, 300, 400 employees. And so when I look at Greg Popovich in a basketball environment, you know, I know, I know there's like support staff and whatnot, but by and large, he has a team of maybe, you know, a handful of coaches and he's got 15 players. And so he's able to see them and interact with them every single day. A lot of us are, are having to deal and run and lead organizations that, we don't see everybody every day or even not even necessarily uh, every year. How do we cascade these kinds of principles in a large organization? Yeah, it's good. That's, that's a really good point. But relationships don't scale, right? Like your relationships are human size. And yeah. so you're exactly right. There's a limited number of people that you can have a close relationship with. So what do smart leaders do? Well, one thing that does scale is purpose. 
purpose. And so they spend a ton of time, a ton of time creating that windshield that I talked about, creating that windshield of purpose, building something I call in the book a mantra map that really outlines what the North Star is and then describes the common problems you're going to get and the common ways to get around it, sort of scripts the key behaviors to being in the organization. So they spend a ton of time creating and being that radio tower that you thought of, that you described yeah. before. I also often think of them as being athletic communicators. Like they'll talk about purpose endlessly and they'll find different ways to connect it to different people. I think we often think of purpose as being like this one big statement that's carved in rock. And it's not. Purpose exists as kind of like more like a jungle. Like there's tons of different ways to express the purpose. There's tons of different contexts in which it works. There's tons of different type of audiences to hear that and show it. There's many different stories you can tell. So, and story is the strongest drug in the world, right? Story. If you can, leaders spending time telling stories about the best things you do and the worst things you do and the barriers to being your best can be one of the most powerful things a leader can do. Um, so, so if you're in that big group, spend a ton of time thinking about purpose and think about your culture, not as a monolith, if you've got 300 people, you've got 10 little, little, you have a cultural ecosystem, right? You have all these microcultures that aren't identical. And to embrace that fact and not think, oh, everybody has to really sort of be this way and dress this way and think this way and talk this way. Um, the idea that you are a greenhouse, you know, there's one leader I said, put it really clearly. He goes, my job here is not to be the best plant. My job is to build the greenhouse where the plants can grow. And so your job as a leader becomes, how can I encourage and spotlight the best of these microcultures around us mm -hmm. and equip them to define themselves and equip them to reflect on where they are at their best and where they could improve? Yeah, no, I like that. Uh, what about situations where you just might not be everybody's cup of tea and you tried everything that you can, but no matter how hard you try, you just can't connect with with one of your one of your employees, one of your colleagues, what do we yeah. do? Then? That's a tough one. I mean, it, it's um, there is there is a rule that I kept bumping into at these great groups, which is zero tolerance for brilliant jerks. You know, the brilliant jerk is somebody who pops up uh, pretty often in our in our society. The person who's a great coder, they, they can solve problems. You know, I work a little bit for the Cleveland Indians. We had one pitcher who was a really good pitcher, but he didn't get along with everybody and really caused a tremendous amount of upset and. Um, you know, the rule zero tolerance is incredibly powerful. I think uh, when you really look at the impact that a jerk has on a culture, he makes it unsafe or she makes it unsafe. And so the, the payoff you get when you take a brilliant jerk and, and get rid of them uh, or move them along is, is really significant, is really, really underrated and really powerful. And so making yeah. that rule evident from the beginning, modeling that and, and sending that message from the top, no brilliant jerks. Yeah. It can be a really powerful way to inoculate yourself against that kind of behavior. <laughs> but to dig into your, to your, your real question though, if somebody's in there that, that, you know, that, that you just don't get along with, or that is a problem. I mean, you know, it's all the, it's all the stuff your parents taught you in some yeah. ways, right? You know, try to build the relationship, try to get in their shoes. A lot of those sort of behaviors are coming out of a place of pain and confusion and, and trying to protect something. Um, and you know, you can't, you can't fix everything, but you can at least sort of try to understand it. And especially at this moment, uh, that we're living through in the, in the world, um, in terms of, uh, the, the increase in awareness that we have about inequality, the increase of the awareness we have about systemic racism, about gender issues, um, this idea that we need to be more empathic and we need to be on a journey to be, um, to understand what it's really like to be in somebody's shoes. That's a hard, that's a journey. That's a hard thing to do. Um, and so kind of owning that, spotlighting that and making that a part of conversation, I think is a really healthy, uh, a really healthy thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. We've got lots of great comments coming in through the chat as well. And I want to remind people that this episode will be available on YouTube later this afternoon. And the podcast is up and running by uh, usually tomorrow morning. So you can catch it there. We also have a really interesting opportunity just to continue to inspire leaders through our various communities on social media. People are more connected there than ever. So tell us what you're learning. Tell us your takeaways from the episode today using the hashtag unleash results. And we'll keep tabs on those and retweet them and interact with those. 
Dan, I, I have a question. I don't know if you've been asked this before, but if you were to rewrite the culture code, mm -hmm. how would the book be different today? Wow, that's pretty good. It wasn't that long ago that I wrote it, but if I guess the thing that has really come into focus for me is how productive tension can be. Like we have this sense like that great cultures are places where everything's harmony, right? Where every idea is a good one and where everybody kind of is, every project is a success. And that every conversation is just a series of great idea, great idea, great idea, great idea. That's not <laughs> true at all. That is the opposite of the truth. Actually, great cultures are where you have the most sort of healthy conflict, you know? Yeah. Um, the opposite of harmony isn't conflict. The opposite of harmony is, 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 is apathy, right? Mm -hmm. You know, to, you, really, you really want to create a culture where that embraces, that identifies what your core tensions are and embraces them. And I think, I'll give an example from my work with the Cleveland Indians. Like there's, you know, we're a baseball team, we're a small market baseball team. And so we don't have all the money. We have to build players. We can't buy them. We can't sign them. We have to, we have to build them out of our minor league system. Yeah. And as a result of that, there's, there's two of these forces in the organization. One of those is innovation, right? And the other is tradition. And if we're going to win, we've got to be more innovative than everybody else. But we also have these, a ton of old time baseball knowledge, these veteran coaches that know the game really deeply. And so the temptation what can happen is that you can get a silo effect, right? You can get those two not talking, but by really saying, look, our core tension is innovation versus tradition. If we can combine this, if we can use this tension to propel us forward and have great conversations where our most revolutionary analyst is having an intense conversation with our like oldest, craggiest coach, like that's, that's the conversation we need to have. Yeah. So knowing that from a leadership position saying, What's our core tension? How can we create that conversation? How can we describe that goal? Yeah. How can we, it really frames the way you look at it. And, and I think it, it sort of creates a narrative for the, for the company, for the group that, you know, tension is a good thing. Like that's why athletes are good athletes. They're able to harness tension and be explosive. And I would say companies are no different. They harness their tensions. So to, to seek out your tension, to embrace them. I didn't fully get that really when I wrote the book. And I feel like I get it now in a yeah. way that, um, that, that makes more sense. I'm laughing like Guy Smiley right now, Dan, because that's our topic next week. We've got a, an innovation expert joining us. And we're, ta we're talking about the innovation delusion. And it's this, it's this idea that we're so focused on innovation and disruption that we're totally neglecting all this wonderful stuff we've already built that works fine. Uh, so it's like, how do, you, how do you sort of manage that paradox, which, uh, which is really good. There, there's a couple other just sort of quick hitters that I think that are would be valuable for, uh, for our audience. And it's, it's hug, this concept of um, hugging the messenger and deep fun. Can you tell us what those two things are, Dan? You bet. You bet. Hugging the messenger. Some Amy Edmondson. Did I see her picture on here? Uh, coming yeah, she, she's joining us for the finale of season three in April. Oh. So she is the, she's the sort of uh, popularizer of psychological safety. And it's, yeah. it's her phrase. Um, and as a leader, people bring us unwelcome messages sometimes. Hard feedback, bad news. And the point she makes is that you shouldn't just not shoot the messenger, right? That's kind of our bar, like don't shoot the messenger. Yeah. You can be better than that, right? Actually make a public and personal thank you to that messenger for bringing that news because you need to make it safe. You need to make it safe for people to bring you that news, especially as a leader, you often get insulated from what's really going on. And so when someone gives you a piece of hard news that tells you what's really going on, that's a pretty cool moment. And so yeah. to actually say, hey, I really appreciate that. And I want you to, everybody to keep doing that. Yeah. And, and what was the second one? The, um, so, so deep fun, this notion deep fun. of deep fun. Yeah. Like fun comes in two flavors. I used to coach little league and my, my assistant coach, uh, she taught me this. There's two flavors of fun and it's shallow and deep and yeah. shallow fun is the fun you have when you're laughing together, when you're having a beer, when you're playing ping pong, it's like the sheer uh, hedonic enjoyment, right? And, but deep fun is, is the fun of solving problems with people you admire. It's not always lighthearted, 
but it's like the solving part of it is super fun. And the connection with other people is really fun. And it's taking on, it's the fun of doing a camping trip with somebody. It's the fun of climbing a mountain with somebody. It's built, the effort is part of it. So, you know, it's really interesting, I think, to a lot of people, I think, think good culture. They think, well, we need to have fun, right? Fun should be part of it. Yeah. And I think shifting the conversation, because we want, shallow fun is easy, right? It really, yeah. it's low bar, it's easy. And it doesn't really create the kind of, deep connection and belonging that the deep fun creates and there's a thing that happens in good cultures and i think some of you guys have probably experienced it where somebody will leave a, a good culture um people will leave the seals they'll leave the spurs they'll leave pixar and then they'll end up coming back because what they'll say is it just didn't feel the same out there like and what they're talking about is the fun of solving hard problems with people you admire and it's a rare thing in life and so it's one of the things that as leaders, if we can build that deep fund in our organizations, uh, it really may, gives them an incredible added value that just just everyday life doesn't bring. I really identify with that. We talk uh, we talk as a team around this uh, this idea that we will walk together forever now based on what we've gone through in the last eleven months. No matter how long we formally work together, we will mm -hmm. walk together forever. And I, and I think that's, uh, that's amazing, Dan. Uh, so what a, a bit of a fun, maybe uh, question for you now. I mean, you've walked the halls of Pixar, been sort of in the proverbial trenches with, uh, with the, the, the Navy SEALs, uh, you know, had dinner with the San Antonio Spurs. I mean, the stakes are high, you know, pressure cooking environments. Uh, what's maybe like an embarrassing moment that happened that you experienced while you were with these groups? If, if, if you could share it, you know, not, not uh, violating any NDAs or privacy laws here that's going to get you thrown in jail by the Navy SEALs. No, there's way too many embarrassing moments to, uh, to even account for. Um, you know, with, with the SEALs, we ended up doing some, some sort of, uh, you know, shooting and obstacle course stuff. That was, it was a little embarrassing when you see that there's a bit of a gap between what a Navy SEAL can do and, and what, what a civilian weekend athlete can do. I would hope. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not, it's not small. Um, yeah. And, and, and I guess in those, in those environments, you know, my job is always kind of to be a fly on the wall and then kind of loop around and, and talk afterwards and connect. I, I got one thing that I guess is not actually, super embarrassing but it's 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 more interesting i think because people in those environments they were all seeking to learn from each other so i became like i went from being like i'm reporting on you to they would always turn the table and be reporting on me saying like oh you've been in the navy seals how do they do it right like they were always flipping it and so i found myself like you know introducing them to each other and and because they have such a learning uh in, curiosity and deep curiosity about performance and about excellence um, I ended up being like a matchmaker for people in these different groups. And some of them now have jobs with each other. And it's just, it's been kind of delightful, but as a journalist, it made me feel like a, like a doofus. Cause it was like, wait a minute. I thought I'm supposed to be asking you questions. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I've got to ask, uh, we're four days away. I'm pulling hard for Brady. Of course, going to be a tough, uh, tall challenge here. Uh, what's your Super Bowl prediction? I don't know. Chiefs are pretty good. I mean, my home's pretty dynamic, um, but I, 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 so I'd say my, my money, if I were to bet, I'd put it on them. Yeah. And we're starting a bit of a new feature. We're going to end every episode now we call three in 30 and it's in it's three simple things that any leader that's tuning into this episode can do in the next 30 days to yep. change their culture, change their leadership, change their business. Dan, what are those three things? Uh, well, one, keep an open face you know, especially over Zoom. This is your frontalis muscle. And it's probably the most important muscle in your body when it comes to signaling attention, engagement. Think about the faces of the leaders you admire. Think about how they use those faces, how they use their eyes. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's powerful. Number two, send the two-line email. The two-line email. This is an idea from Laszlo Bach at Google. Um, it is... Uh, Actually, now he's at a place called Humu, which is a really super fascinating company. Two lines. You send it to your yeah. people you work with. Tell me one thing you want me to keep doing and tell me one thing you want me to stop doing. Short email, yeah. really big signal. Yeah. And number three, uh, do an AAR. Do an after action review. After you do something as a team, circle up for five minutes. Yeah. And three questions. What went right? What went wrong? What are we going to do differently? And, and make it real non-judgmental. Even have a junior person lead it. Actually, that can be a powerful way to sort of send that signal that, look, we're about getting better here. Um, so yeah, open face, two-line email, AAR. Incredible. Thanks Dan, for tuning in. 
Now, if you found today's conversation helpful, don't forget to share it with your friends and colleagues who like learning as much as you do. And if you're a leader of a business and you're ready to take the next step because you know there's unleashed potential that exists within it, don't wait another minute. Go to UnleashResults.com and subscribe to our newsletter. We'll take care of the rest.